Hey guys, so what's up? Yeah, I know, this is not exactly a video, it's more of a recording, but under the circumstances, I had to do it this way. Um, basically, this is not exactly the video that I wanted to put out this month, but I still wanted to link this to what I wanted to do. Like, consider this to be sort of a preview or a part one of what I originally wanted to do. See, I was inspired, again, by the last video I put up on, you know, different sword types, you know, as, as far as Chinese weapons are concerned, and how they possibly have been used. And it basically got me thinking about the Chinese saber, the Dao, and how those weapons have been used. In particular, it got me thinking about, again, something that someone had mentioned earlier. You know, in one of my earlier comments sections under the Tang Dao, basically on how that weapon was made to be used primarily in two hands, and how its blade shape was designed, you know, for cutting through harder surfaces like armor. This got me thinking about the other Dao that had been made down the line, all the way up to the common one that is used these days by Chinese martial artists, you know, practitioners, which is the oxtail doll. Now, what's interesting about that particular weapon is that despite the fact that it's the most ubiquitous training, you know, sword, you know, a melee weapon in Chinese martial arts these days, it wasn't the most commonly used weapon in Chinese martial arts until well after the Qing Dynasty had fallen. And it's primarily a civilian's weapon. Like basically, by the end of the Qing Dynasty, the Chinese military had pretty much adopted European-style saber blades for their military officers, while the <clears throat> martial artists, as you know, we tend to typify them, you know, the Chinese martial artists, tended to use the oxtail doll. So that's basically why it is, you know now considered the, you know, the ubiquitous weapon that we see in Chinese martial arts when it comes to saber use and saber training. And that's all well and good. But the thing is, it wasn't the most commonly used doll before then. That would be the willow leaf saber or the, and the goose quill saber, which is the, excuse my butchering of the pronunciation here, the um, Liu Wei doll and the Yanma doll, respectively. Those were not just used, you know, primarily by the military, but also by the civilians at the time as well. Now, you might be thinking, well, okay, what's the big deal? Um, you know, if they, if the civilians moved over to the oxtail, though, okay, then that would make sense that that's what we're using now. And today's, you know, Chinese martial arts would have moved over to that. Well, not so fast. See, several of the styles that Chinese martial artists are training in these days claim to be linked back to older styles that were created during the Ming and Qing dynasties. Like, if you're practicing something like, say, Cha Fist, or Xing Yichuan, or, um, I don't know, uh, Pigua, um, Pigua Zhang, or Pigua Zhen, you know, if you're using styles like that, well, those styles are supposedly older arts that popped up before the Republican era of China. So, what type of doll were they using? Because those styles that I mentioned did use the doll. And these days, people practicing the doll forms of those styles, they're using the oxtail doll. But again, as I've already mentioned, those were not the popular weapon that was used until way later in Chinese history. So what's going on here? Now, it should already, you know, be obvious to the people who watch my channel how much difference a blade shape can make in terms of how you use it. You know, in terms of the blade geometry, how wide it is, how narrow it is, the edge shape, the weight distribution, all those things play a part. But just in case I have to make things clear, because I'm pretty sure some other people are like, well, a curved blade is a curved blade. What's the difference? Let, let, let's go back a bit. Let, let's go back a bit here. See, first of all,
first of all, we got to start with the fact that originally Chinese dolls weren't curved. They were straight. Um, there's a general term used for these straight doll. Um, I believe they were called um, almost a Zhan model, but that's actually um, their long two-handed swords. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me for messing up my um, terms here. Um, it's, it's Jibei doll. Those are the straight-backed doll, or you know, straight. It's just roughly translated, I believe, as straight-backed knives. By the way, that's what dao means. It means knife in Chinese. I think I've mentioned this before. Um, but yeah, the earliest versions of the dao were all straight. And the earliest one, I originally thought that the earliest ones that popped up were during the Han Dynasty. But it turns out it was actually from the Shang Dynasty. It's just that during the late Han Dynasty onwards, they became the standard military weapon. They replaced the dian. You know, the straight sword. Um, the Chinese Zen was originally, you know, the more common military weapon. But after having to deal with the curved weapons, you know, you know, from the um, people in the north, they were like, okay, you know what, the, the, the Dao was a better weapon. But just like the Zen, they were straight as well. And all the way through, all, um, all the way through the different dynasties up until the Song Dynasty, they tended to be straight. And this goes through the Tang Dynasty as well, as, as you've guys seen, and tended to be straight. It's very rare to find any curved versions of them. But once we get up to, like, say, you know, the Song Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, Ming and Qing, they start getting curved. And this is where we start getting all the different names because of the different blade shapes and, you know, different geometries of all of them. Now, keep in mind that even though we have, quote-unquote, official names for these Dao, they're as official as, say, the different types of European long swords, you know, or, or like the different types of straight bladed swords you see in different European arts. Whether one, you know, it, you guys got many different types of, say, hilt shapes and hand shapes and all that, and, you know, I'm sorry, hand grips, sword grips. And they are basically approximations. Like, there's a lot of crossover that goes on when you're trying to classify different blade shapes and hilt types and all that. And it's the same thing with the Chinese weapons as well. So, even though we got terms like Yanma Dao, um, Niu Wei Dao, Pian Dao, um, Niu Wei Dao, and again, I'm sorry for the mispronunciations of these. Even though we got those terms that we more or less have a general shape to work with, there is a lot of overlap and crossover. And, it can be hard to classify, but you know, for quick, hard, fast, dirty rules, this is what we're going through. The more popular versions are, again, the Yan Madal, which is the Goose Quill Saber. And what's interesting about that particular weapon is that it's, it, it seems to be the transition between the straight doll and the curved doll. And many have surmised and have even arg successfully argued that it was a good crossover for the Dian user who needs to start using Dao. Like, if you're used to using straight weapons, you know, especially the straight sword, and then you move over to a Dao, which is more of a cutting weapon, but you've got all these, you know, Dian techniques, well, how, you know, are you going to, like, force yourself to relearn a whole weapon skill, or are you, you going to, like, rely on the skills that you already have? Well, with a Yan Ma Dao or a Goose Quill Saber, you can actually use the techniques you already know if you're used to using a den or some other straight sword or, you know, straight bladed weapon in that it's straight up until a certain point. The Goose Quill Saber's general blade shape is that you get straight up until, let's say, like the last third or last fourth of the blade. Then from that point to the tip, it curves a bit upward. So because of that and also, you know, and also since the, the center of percussion is near the blade's tip, the thrusting attack, you can still thrust pretty well with it, just like with a den. And yet you can still do very well with cutting and slashing, which is the Dao's primary feature. So it's a good crossover weapon, as I mentioned before. And you saw a lot of those during, say, like the Ming Dynasty. Then we get to the Liu, um, Liu Yedo, or the Willow Leaf Saber, which is probably the most common saber that was used during the Ming and Qing dynasties up until the fall of the Qing dynasty, and then you start seeing the oxtail saber, or the Niu Wei Dao. 
Now, that particular one has a deeper curve. It's not super deep, it's, you know, but it's got a more moderate curve along the entire length of the blade. Unlike the Yanma Dao, where it starts curving toward the end of the blade. And this one is more of a slashing type of weapon. Yes, you can thrust with it, but the point control isn't going to be as good as, say, with a young model, you know, the goose quill, or, of course, with a straight weapon. So this is more of your cutter. This is where we start, you know, like, you're pretty much committing yourself to the cut with this weapon. And again, this is the one that, you know, for all intents and purposes, was the more commonly used weapon. So when I started thinking about the martial arts that were used at that time that we supposedly still are training in now, even though it's more recreationally, when you start thinking of Chao Chuan, you start thinking of um, Xing Chuan, you start thinking of, like, you know, Xing Chuan is more, um, more known for use with the spear, but yet they did use sabers as well. Um, you start, you know, thinking of these other styles. Um, Pi Guo Zhang or Pi Guo Chuan is another good version I can think of that used the doll. So I think in these weapons, that's the sword that, or, you know, it's the weapon that they use, the willow leaf. And then, of course, we got deeper cutting ones, like the pian dao, or the slashing saber, but that one was used more in conjunction with a shield. And before you guys start asking, no, I don't know too much about that. I'm trying to research more about it, because I'm really interested in seeing what styles, or at least what particular schools still, you know, use and teach the whole shield and saber, you know, art. Because weapons with a shield is something that a lot of people don't associate with Chinese martial arts. For good reason. You rarely see it. It does exist, and there are examples of it, in, you know, in textbooks and all that. And we sometimes even see people to this day training in a version of it. But it's usually some flashier version of it. And I'm more interested in seeing, you know, the different military groups that use this at the time, or even a civilian martial artist that may have use the rattan shield and saber combo but yeah that's you know another version and then of course we got the oxtail though so having said all that and talking about the different blade shapes and oh yeah by the way if we're going to be talking about the oxtail doll in case you don't know what that is that is the you know that's the more common saber that we see today when people think doll they're mostly thinking of the mm -hmm. oxtail saber that's the one that people picture in their head. That's the one that you tend to see in Kung Fu movies. Even when you shouldn't be seeing it for the time period that they're doing it in. You know, depending on the story. Um, but yeah, if you go to a Kung Fu school and they start teaching you the doll, that version, the, the weapon you're picking up is... <laughs> nine times out of ten, that's an oxtail saber that you're training with. Oxtail doll. And again, that one was a primarily a civilian weapon that popped up during the end of the Qing Dynasty onward. So, I guess in some ways you can call it the definitive, you know, Chinese martial arts doll after the fall of the Qing Dynasty. Like, that became the weapon that they latched to. And so you can say that, well, again, if we're practicing these martial arts these days, it's perfectly married to it. And you may have a point there. But as I mentioned earlier, if certain Chinese martial arts were training in, went back further than the fall of the Qing Dynasty, then it stands to reason that they used the more popular Dao. How, so wouldn't that mean that if we're still training in those methods now, and yet we're using a weapon that uses a different blade shape and blade feel, wouldn't that mess up the techniques that you're using? Because again, if we're going to be going back to the Oxtail Dao, that blade is wider than the other ones I've mentioned. It's got a more forward-feeling weight than the other ones. And it has a wider blade. It's not just has a wider blade, but the edge shape. And just generally, you know, the way the blade was crafted was not just to make it easier for civilians to be able to slash and cut and chop with it, but it was also made specifically to deal with people who weren't wearing armor. Like it's, it's, made to, it's, it's easier to cut through flesh with this. And as somebody who messed with you know, as you guys saw earlier when I was using the Tong Dao, for instance, that thing was made for two-handed use against armor, and you saw that it wasn't exactly easy to just slice through things. Like, you really had to make sure that your cut, your, your blade alignment was perfect with that. Whereas with the Oxtail one, it's so easy to slice through, you know, softer targets, because that's what it was made for. 
But that particular weapon, by the way, is definitely a slicing, chopping, cutting weapon. It's not really made for the thrust. Yes, you can thrust with it. Yes, you can pr get the point where you need it to go, but it wasn't really made for that. And when you consider that it's going to be easier to thrust with, say, you know, the Yanmado or the Liu Yedo, and then you start thinking about the Chinese martial arts forms with the dollar that actually engage the thrust, it's probably going to get your noodle, you know, thinking. Like, you're like, wait a second, what's, what's going on here? Am I using the wrong weapon for this? Quote, unquote. And I, I say quote, unquote, because, well, okay, here's where we're going to start getting into my opinion and, and my conjecture here, which is, is a dangerous thing, to, you know, to deal with. And I know they're going to be, yeah, well, I should say I know, but I'm sure there's going to be someone saying, wait a minute, you're wrong about that, which I welcome, because, again, this isn't something that I know too much about. Hence, you know, why this video didn't come out the way I wanted to, and I'll get into that in a moment. Here's the thing. Despite what some people are going to state, and there's a lot of people who want to believe this, Chinese martial arts has gone through a lot of reconstruction. Whether we want to admit it or not, it has. A lot of styles that want to claim roots to ancient times aren't really that ancient or rather the way we're practicing it and the techniques we're using probably aren't being practiced or being performed exactly the same way it was done before. For one thing, you have to remember that we're no longer, for the most part, we're no longer using these martial arts for self-defense. Most of us are practicing Chinese martial arts as a form of recreation. You know, whether it's for, even if you're training in it for self-defense, the fact is you're not training in it in the way, say, somebody who's going to become a bodyguard might. You know, like, like back then when you were training in martial arts because it was what's going to put food on your table. Very few of us are doing it for those reasons and in that context where one buck up and you're dead. We're not really under that sort of strain. So that already removes a lot of, you know, the context of why we're training in this, which could alter the way we do our training. And believe it, me, it does definitely alter the way you train. Look at Tai Chi practitioners if you want a good example of that. But not only you have that aspect removing us from the way it was practiced in the past, but then there's also these large gaps where these arts just stop being practiced for a little while. Despite people trying to claim, oh no, there was a continuous line. No, there wasn't. There are a lot of arts that claim a continuous line. No, no. Maybe a name only, but there's always, like, Shini is a good example of that. Like, people claim, oh, it was made during this time period. And then there's like several years where no one knows what it is, and then all of a sudden this guy, one guy pops up who reconstructs those styles or those those techniques as I, I brought it back. Well, there's controversy there. I mean, that's a subject for another video, but you might as well just say that this guy was the founder of this style and he gave it this name. It starts with him. But let's say that he did take those techniques from way before. He found a manual somewhere and reinterpreted the techniques. Which, by the way, a lot of Chinese martial arts start with a, a similar sort of, say, creation story like that. Like, there was this older style, and this great master made it, but he wrote it in a book, and people forgot about it, and this guy found the book that was given to him by some immortal or fairy or old monk or some other mysterious person, and the guy recreates the techniques. Okay, fine. But then that means you're, it's no longer a direct line to whatever it originally was, if indeed it was an original version of it. And we do have more concrete versions of this. A good example I can give to that is Lost Track Boxing. Um, Mi Zhong Chuan, sometimes known as um, Yan Qing Boxing. If there was ever an art that has been like, brought up and then lost and then brought up again or reinterpreted or reformed. That it definitely um um lost track. It's it, just trying to research the history of lost track boxing. It, it, that that's a journey in and of itself. Uh, which I guess considering the name of the style I guess it's fitting. But it's all over the place and trying to figure out like who created it, how did it start, who were practitioners, like if you look at more fairly recent Chinese history, we can finally start coming with with a concrete development of it. I mean, it's probably its most famous practitioner was Huo Yunjia, who later on helped to develop um, 
Mijongjia, the are the um, lost track methods that later on formed a lot of the um, the forms and fist forms that were practiced in the now famous um, in the Jing Wu school, which we later on get you know those movies you know Fist of Fury that Bruce Lee played the, the famous Chen Chen character, and we can get on with that. But yeah, Ho Yunjia practiced Mijongjia, and yet if you want to okay, I want to study the original lost track. Good luck. <laughs> There's a lot of arguments on whose version is the most original, which one is the most direct. Like, and considering that it has two names, you either, you got either Mi Zhongquan or you got Yang Qing. Which one you want? <laughs> and with different names, obviously, most likely there's going to be different interpretations. And then even with Mi Zhong, you either got the Mi Zhong fist or you got the Mi Zhong methods. Which ones you want? See what I mean? So, I mean, right there, just, just that alone, it, within an art in and of itself, you can see examples where the path isn't straight. It's development, the so-called lineage, the so-called direct line back to its origins. There's some bumps along the way. The, the, the path is crooked. Things diverge. Now, when you mix that up with what happened during the fall of the Qing Dynasty, the, the, the rise of the Republican era, which soon later on fell apart, and then you get the Communist era. And we know how troubled that in Chinese martial arts history was then. And then you put in what I asked before about Dao usage, and whether or not these forms that we're practicing now, are they really from the past? And if so, are they the correct ones to use, quote-unquote correct? Because I know you can modify anything to work with whatever weapon. You, you can find ways. I'm just simply saying... Let's say there was a certain martial arts style that was made to be used with this particular type of Dao because of its particular blade characteristics. If we later on try to use those same techniques with a different shaped blade, what's going to have to change? Has anything changed? If things didn't change, then does that mean that we're, you know, we're not getting the full potential of those techniques? What's going on here? That's the question that I wanted answered, or at least to have a real answer for, for this video. And at the time of this recording, I do not have an answer. I don't have anything concrete. What I have been doing this month is trying to research that question. I've even reached out to people way more knowledgeable than me, you know, in terms of martial arts. I have not gotten a response yet. I have been told that my question was very interesting. Um, one person um, who I highly respect, and I'm hoping he gets back to me soon. Um, he said that he'll try to. They, they said they'll try to get back to me on that one. I haven't gotten anything back so far, but they they're very very busy. So I can understand if I don't get an answer. But it, that that's basically what's keeping me from making this video the way I wanted it to. So basically, what you're hearing from me is just conjecture in history that you guys probably already know. And I apologize for that. I will say this. If I was going to bet on it, I think the answer lies with a mix of, yeah, it, it, the, the forms we're practicing today were probably modified to work with the Dao that we use today. And or people probably just were like, you know... Whatever, a saber is a saber is a saber. A doll was a doll was a doll. There's probably a mix of that, but I'm really thinking as a, I'm really thinking that the forms that we're training in today were probably modified to work with what we are training with. There's plenty of examples of that, uh, and, and plenty of lots of evidence to see how things altered. I mean, again, look at Tai Chi Chuan. The way people are practicing it now these days is nowhere near with the way people were. If I go to a, a typical Tai Chi Chuan practitioner and I go, so how's your weight training going? Weight training? What? Body conditioning. Are you guys at least engaging in that? What? They, they look at me as if I was nuts. That's not, that's not how you train Tai Chi Chuan, but that's what they did that in the past. And, you know what I mean? So just that alone, you can see there's a divergence. So imagine with weapons. So that that's where, that's, that's where I'm betting. I'm betting that, yeah. Things changed with the training tools that we've got right now. But I I'm really interested to see how they changed, who made the changes, um, or if there was that much of a change at all. And for those of you who do practice with the doll, 
I would be interested, especially those of you who practice with different dogs, I'd be interested in hearing your guys' opinions on if there really is that much of a difference in usage between, say, a goose quill saber and an oxtail saber. Like, do you guys feel that there is that much of a difference? I would think that you can make it work between the weapons, but there's enough of a noticeable difference that you might have a preference. But I could be wrong. You know, so that, 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 that's basically where I'm going to end it off here. This is the path that I've put myself on this month. And so far, this is all I've been able to gather. But I'm, I'm hoping to be able to have a part two to this soon where I can have something a little bit more concrete. Till then, I hope this was interesting enough for you guys. And I hope it sparks some good discussion. And I will catch you guys later.